Have you ever had an acne breakout come at the worst possible time? I know I have. I'm an actor, and there have been so many times when I've had to go to an audition with a huge breakout on my face. We've all had struggles with our skin, and that's why we are excited to partner with Apostrophe, the sponsor of this episode. Apostrophe is a prescription skincare company that offers science-backed oral and topical medications that are clinically proven to help clear acne. At Apostrophe, an expert dermatology team will create a personalized treatment plan that is perfectly tailored to your unique skin. Simply fill out Apostrophe's online quiz about your skin goals and medical history, then snap a few selfies and a board-certified dermatologist will create your initial customized treatment plan. Apostrophe treats all types of acne, from hormonal acne to facial acne and even chest knee, back knee, and butt knee. They treat breakouts from head to toe. I don't really wear makeup, so for me, having clear skin is crucial. I've been using Apostrophe for a few weeks now, and there's already a noticeable difference in my skin. Like, people have actually told me that my skin looks good, which is something that doesn't usually happen to me. We have a special deal for our audience. Save $15 off your first visit with an apostrophe provider at apostrophe.com slash whomst when you use our code whomst. That's W-H-O-M-S-T. This code is only available to our listeners. To get started, just go to apostrophe.com slash whomst and click begin visit. Then use our code whomst at sign up and you'll get your first visit for only $5. That's A-P-O-S-T-R-O-P-H-E dot com slash whomst, W-H-O-M-S-T, and use that code whomst to get your first dermatologist-crafted treatment plan for $5, and we thank Apostrophe for sponsoring the podcast. Hey, everyone. Before we begin today, we want to give a huge shout out to our newest patron, Maddie. Welcome to the team. We're about to start a new season in September, which means our patrons are going to get to follow along with all my scribbles in the margins of my book. If that sounds cool to you, head on over to patreon.com slash pod and prejudice. This week's episode is covering Accomplished, a new book by Amanda Quain, which is on sale now. So go grab a copy of the book and enjoy this week's episode with our guest, the author herself, Amanda Quain. Are you familiar with Sense and Sensibility, the plot? Deeply. Oh, yes. So... uh... Molly found out maybe like halfway through like the third chapter that Brandon and Marianne ended up together. And she was like, I think I just got a big sense and sensibility spoiler. And I had like a meltdown about it and was like, oh no, that like, that's a huge thing to figure out like this early on in the book. She'll like never trust Willoughby if she knows that Marianne's going to end up with Brandon. And then it, we got to the end of the book and Molly was like, Marianne ends up with Brandon. And so she just got like an Emma <laughs> spoiler, which is our next book we're covering. And she's like, oh my God, I can't believe I got this big Emma spoiler. And I was like, give it a few months. You're going to be fine. Yeah, you'll, you'll be set. <laughs> yeah. I just have to not think about it is all. I think you're going to be fine. <laughs> This is Becca. This is Molly. We're here to talk about Jane Austen. We are here specifically to talk about a brand new novel called Accomplished. It's based on Pride and Prejudice. And we are here joined today by the author, Amanda Quain. Amanda, how are you doing? I'm so good, Molly. I'm so happy to be here. We're so excited to have you. Tell us who you are and what you do. So my name is Amanda Quain, and I am an indie bookseller slash author. So I work for a, um, I'm the children's book buyer for a small indie bookstore in Northern Virginia, um, which means I bring in like all the new kids books for the season, which is really fun. That's so cool. It's the best job. I get to just like pick out books. I'm so jealous. That's like a dream job. Holy crap. It's pretty ideal. And, and you write novels too. Wow. You, you are just living my, like my dream. It was very <laughs> surreal this last year. I got to order my own book for the store. Wow. Oh. I was like, you know what? I think, I think maybe three guys. I think maybe we can bring three in of this one. Congratulations. And then we like sent in an order for the full order. Like I'm doing my signed pre-orders through my bookstore. So like we needed a bunch, but I was like, mm, what? Oops, five. Oh, I love that so much. Yeah, it's it's really fun. So I do those and then I live in Pennsylvania and write books and think about Jane Austen like all the time. That's sort of my deal. Can relate. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, you, you all get it. Amanda, thanks so much for joining. So we have so many questions for you about your novel, Accomplished, which is an adaptation of Pride and Prejudice. But before we get into describing the book, talking about the book, we're going to start by asking you a couple questions we ask all of our guests, starting with, what is your relationship to Jane Austen? So I think sort of like 
cool aunt and like fun niece is my ideal Jane Austen relationship. But in terms of how I came to her, um, I started reading Jane Austen. I was probably in like early high school when I first got given. I got given a set of the Dover Thrift Editions um, by one of my parents, like British friends, which feels like a very good way to get a full set of Jane Austen novels. Like it felt very legit. Um, and I read Pride and Prejudice first and loved it. And then read Sense of Sensibility and loved that. And then I kind of petered off. But right around that time, not to give away too much about my age, but you can triangulate where I am based on the fact that right around the same time, the 2005 Pride and Prejudice came out. And I was like, I'm all in. <laughs> this is my forever. Uh, and then in college, I took a class that was just called Jane Austen, where we like read every single one of her books and did like a nine week session on each one. And they brought a different instructor in for each book to like talk about their specialty related to the book. It was a fantastic class. Wow. Yeah. That is an awesome class. I want to take that class. It was so good. Like when we did, I won't, this is just a general theme spoiler, Molly, but like when we did Northanger Abbey, the specialist came in, was like a professor of Gothic literature who like led us through that level of the book. And I just, yeah, I got all in. And then I studied abroad in London as one often does when you are the sort of person I am and just kind of stayed with the story from there on out. I love that. So that brings me to my next question. Other than this book you wrote, what is your favorite Austin content? This includes books, movies, uh, really out there adaptations, whatever speaks to you most. I love that you said other than this book I wrote, as if this is my favorite Austin <laughs> adaptation. I'm someone's favorite Austin adaptation. That, oh my God, I can't even imagine. Um, so I have my go-to and then I have a new go-to. But my all-time favorite Austin adaptation has always been Clueless. I just... I love it. Emma, I like Emma a lot, but Clueless is perfect. It captures what I love in an Austin adaptation where you take like the very soul of the thing, but put it in an entirely different setting that still somehow works. Also, I'm in love with Paul Rudd. Yeah. Which helps. Who isn't? I mean, that's he's, correct. He's been a, a heartthrob for straight up like 25 years straight. I don't know what he's doing besides being pure of heart, but I love him. Um, and then recently I've gotten super into Fire Island, the new um, Hulu Pride and Prejudice retelling. It's so good. Wow. Fun fact, listeners. That's the next episode that we're talking about after this. So <laughs> oh if you haven't gosh. seen it yet, great time to go watch Fire Island. So which Jane Austen character do you relate to the most? Uh, so I think this is going to be my answer for like half the questions you asked me. But <laughs> you know how some people are like, I'm a Lizzie Bennet. And I don't know if you guys have read, um, there's this amazing, also new Austin adaptation that came out this last year called Being Mary Bennett by J.C. Peterson. We've had a lot of people recommend that to us. Oh my gosh, it's so fun. And the author, Jenny, is just an absolute delight. She and I are buds. But she talks a lot about how like most, a lot of people who read Pride and Bridges are actually more Marys, if you think about it. Mm -hmm. And I get that, but I myself am actually a Charles Bingley. That's kind of my vibe. Yes, I love that. Bingley is one of my favorite characters in Austin. So I, I always enjoy a Charles Bingley in real life. We love sunny and friendly. Yes, exactly. <laughs> I, you know, it's just the golden retriever vibes you wish to see in the world. Exactly. And manifest them yourself if you do not actually have a golden retriever. So it's true. That brings us to our last general Austin question for you. What is your hottest Austin take? Uh, oh my gosh. I don't know that I... I don't have that many controversial Austin opinions. I feel like most of them are pretty common, but I will say, and if if you guys have to tell me if I had to re-record this, this is going to get me like thrown out of your audience. Colin Firth to me will always be a dad from Mamma Mia before he's a Darcy. So I'm a 2005 girl and I think Colin Firth's so talented, but to me, he's not Darcy. That's definitely a hot take, but we leave it in. We live for the drama on this podcast. We do live for the drama. So sorry, everyone. Please still buy my book. Our listeners are a pretty even split okay. between the 2005 and the 1995, actually. Okay. When we covered the adaptation, we brought on two different guests to discuss it. The first one was like... The 2005 Pride and Prejudice is my favorite Jane Austen content of all time and the only time I've really related to the story of Pride and Prejudice. The other person was like, Pride and Prejudice is one of my favorite books and I can't believe this movie was made. It's a disgrace. So we have, we love a diverse set of opinions on okay, the two, 2005. This podcast leans positive on the 2005 with in our hearts believing that the 1995 is a little better, but we, we love all Pride and Prejudice content. <laughs> Okay, uh, I think we're ready to talk about Accomplished, aren't we? Yes, let's talk about it. So first things first, talking about this novel, I will just say to our listeners, the full 
title of this novel is Accomplished, a Georgie Darcy novel. Which is thrilling because we are Justice for Georgie stands over yes. here. We love Georgiana Darcy. What an amazing character. We're team protect Georgiana at all costs. All costs. <laughs> Parts of this book must have been challenging for you. <laughs> yes, definitely. <laughs> she was not protected the whole book. So for our listeners, uh, let's talk about what Accomplished is. Tell us a little bit about the concept and what inspired you to write the book. Accomplished is, as you guys said, Pride and Prejudice, but it's from the point of view of Georgiana Darcy. Normally, this is where I explain who Georgiana Darcy is, but I feel like for this group, you probably have a pretty good idea among the listeners. Um, so we pick up Georgie, um, because this is a contemporary retelling, at the beginning of her junior year of high school at Pemberley Academy, the boarding school that she attends, that her brother Fitz attended before her. And she has just come back after recovering from what we call the incident, capital T, capital I, um, with Wickham Foster, her brother Fitz's childhood best friend turned her something or other who may or may not have been dealing at her all out of her dorm room and gotten kicked out of school, pulling her reputation along with him. So at this point, the whole school hates her. Her brother does not trust her because he had to save her from all the things Wickham did. And she basically has nothing and no one and is determined to rebuild her reputation from the ground up. And she decides the best way to do that is to become the perfect Darcy. By doing that, she will regain her brother's trust, she'll regain the affections of Pemberley Academy, and she'll win the day. Of course, things are never quite that easy. No, certainly not. Especially not in either a Jane Austen novel or in a young adult uh, fiction novel. So let's talk a bit about why you decided Georgiana. What inspired you to focus on Georgie as a character? Okay, so I'll give you the, the quick answer first and then I'll elaborate. And the short answer is the Jonas Brothers. <gasps> oh. <laughs> what, a, what a shocking and thrilling answer to that question. We both just, <laughs> our jaws just fell to the floor, listeners. That was the best simultaneous reaction I've ever received to giving that answer. <laughs> Let, allow me to elaborate slightly. Um, so a few years ago, I had sort of two perfect parallel universes meet in the middle to create this book. So I was thinking a lot about the Darcy's as a whole. Um, I come from theater as my background, as well as writing. And I had been working on a play, um, with my best friend, Rebecca, um, that we wrote together and started in called Hey Darcy, a Bromantic Comedy, which was the tale, we're going to take this on tour at some point, because I've talked about it in like all of these interviews. Um, but it's a story told in dual timeline of Bingley and Darcy's road trip to Netherfield before Pride and Prejudice starts, aligned with their grand tour of Europe when they're 18, like basically sleeping and winding their way through the continent. Wow. And I play Bingley and my friend plays Darcy and we just like explore toxic masculinity. That has really big like Matt and Ben vibes. It was very much Matt and Ben. Thank you. I try to pitch it as that a lot, but people didn't always know who Matt and Ben was. So thank you, Molly. You It's the exact same vibes as that, but Regency. Love it. Listeners, for those of you who may not know, Matt and Ben is a Mindy Kaling project with a, her writing partner that is about the writing of Goodwill Hunting. And it's told by two female actresses, usually playing Matt Damon and Ben Affleck. It's a great play, and we are such theater nerds on this podcast, so you're fitting in just fine. <laughs> okay, perfect. Um, So we were writing that, and so I was spending a lot of time. Darcy Darcy was sort of the main emotional arc of that show, though Bingley had his own stuff to do, but Darcy just had a lot of things to unpack before he can fall in love. So I was spending a lot of time in Darcy's head and thinking about like who he is as a person and why he became this way. And then right around the same time, the Jonas Brothers got back together, which was very thrilling for me personally. <laughs> you know, as like a died in the wool millennial, obviously the Joe Bros were like my number one back when I was in high school and, you know, still really. Um, and there was a documentary that came out about them. I, I forget the name of the documentary. I really should have looked this up by now. I forget it every time I talk about it. But it was about the three of them, like how they found their way back to each other. And they like filmed as they reunited and like worked through their problems and it was, it's a, it was fascinating, but I was just struck the whole time watching the three of them together. And Joe particularly, who is the middle Jonas Brothers, as I'm sure you two know, yeah. Oh, yeah. just seemed like every time the three of them would be together, he would like have his arm around one of his brothers or like be touching them in some way. And just like you could tell in the interviews how much he missed them and how like hurt he was by what had happened, but just like how much he needed his family back together. And I was, it was so like, I got really into it. And just like, even when you watch their concert videos now, Joe always has his arm around the brother. He's just like always trying to pull them in and trying to get that intimacy. And then when I was thinking a lot about that, and then I was thinking a lot about the Darcy's, they kind of just came together of like, what is it like to be 
part of that family. Like, what does being a Darcy mean, not just as a romantic hero, but like as a person who has to go through life and interact with siblings and with parents and with the world? And that's kind of where Georgiana came in to me. That's like a very heartfelt answer. And as people, who, we love Georgie on this podcast and she's definitely a character we don't spend enough time with in Pride and Prejudice. What uh, inspired you to use Pride and Prejudice in particular to tell this story? What about the Darcy family really spoke to you? What about the story really spoke to you as something that like you could adapt and tell this family-based story with in the modern era? So, I mean, I think it was really that the story came to me as Georgiana's story. Like, I wasn't coming into this looking to tell a sibling story. I was just, like, just started thinking a lot about, like, who Georgiana was. And, like, in the book, she has no lines of dialogue in the original text of Pride and Prejudice, which I think people often forget because in the movies and the other adaptations, she gets expanded, reasonably so. But even then, she's still just, like, I'm beautiful and accomplished and perfect. But when you look at what happened with her and Wickham, like, she's, like, 14. and just. If that happened to me when I was 14, I wouldn't have been okay. And the idea that she was always struck me as a little bit off. And so I do think that nothing in my book contradicts what we see in Pride and Prejudice, because we do get those scenes like of what we see in the original text in my version. And Georgiana wants so badly to be the perfect sister to her brother that she puts on the like, I'm Georgiana, I'm perfect, I'm happy, I'm fun. But then like, underneath all of that is just like teenage trauma you know totally yes we all know we were all teenage girls we all get it oh god I was such a mess as a teenage girl same Becca knows I was so what spoke to you about modernizing it like why did you choose to tell this as a modern YA novel as opposed to like delving into a period piece writing style I think part of it is just that, like, I, although I I love historical fiction and have read a lot of it, contemporary YA is really what I, like, grew up on and loved reading. Like, I, there's a direct, like, pipeline between the, like, 40,000 Meg Cabot books I read growing up and accomplished. Like, that's always, my voice is always leaned towards sort of, like, the snarky and the pop culture references and things like that. And although I'd love to one day dabble in something a little bit more historical, that sort of contemporary poppy teen voice is really where I've always felt myself drawn to. I was a very angsty teen in a lot of ways. So my uh, pipeline was very much Sarah Dessen mm. to loving Emily Bronte. Fair, yes. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I can definitely relate to uh, the, the poppy YA enjoyment uh, from my youth in general. I just love it. So let's talk about Darcy, because you took one of the most iconic characters in the literary canon and you captured his human disasteritude and brought it into the most anxious 19 year old 20 year old kid like on the face of the planet so let's talk about Darcy what's the most essential element of adapting Fitzwilliam Darcy to the modern era so I think a lot of it comes down to just like the need to control things around him and being very uncomfortable when he can't Like, when you see him in the original, like, when he's at a ball or somewhere where he doesn't understand the social situation, that's where he's the most uncomfortable. And so here, when he's in, like, the midst of this huge familial crisis, because in my version of it, which is only gently adapted from the original, like, their their father died a few years ago, um, and their mom left. So when Fitz was 16, he became, like, the head of the family of him and Georgie. So he's basically been a father figure to Georgie, whether they wanted him to be or not, the last few years now. And she's just had this huge incident that he couldn't stop. Um, and now he has to try to pick up the pieces from, from that. And I think trying to, like... And he also, like, he upended his life, basically. When this happened, he had been um, out in California at Caltech. Um, at the end of her soft- Georgie's sophomore year when Wickham's incident happened. And so he transfers to a local SUNY school to be closer to her and to basically babysit her um, at the beginning of our story. And just he just wants so badly to fix things himself. And when he can't, because you can't always fix other people's problems, that's very challenging for him. Yeah. This isn't so much a question as just I really like the phrase you just used, which was um, gently adapted from the original, because I did feel like while I was reading it, I was like, there are the main elements of Pride and Prejudice here. Like I'm following Darcy's storyline through his phone calls with Georgie and everything. Mm -hmm. But it really got to take on a life of its own because you were following a character that's sort of in the peripheral of 
the original story. And I thought that was really cool. And I also noticed a few things that I won't give away, but there were some things that were like notably different from the original story, particularly Mm -hmm. with Lizzie Bennett and Lydia Bennett, which I loved. Like I thought that the changes that you made to that storyline made Lizzie so much more of a badass. And, um, and I will just like leave it there so that our listeners go and buy the book. And further without uh, giving anything away to our listeners, I will say, I want to commend you for, uh, putting us in a different part of the story mm-hmm. and a different perspective than obviously the Lydia Z. Bennett story, because then we get to meet new characters who are organic. Avery. And I I was going to go with, I'm not going to spoil who you're going to meet. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. okay, okay. <laughs> well, we, can talk, we can talk about Avery. Avery's on in the cover flap. So we can talk about Avery a little bit. Um, Yeah. Just, just such a, such an organic modern day character that fits seamlessly into Georgie Darcy's story and such a lovable character in ways that I will not go into because I do not want to spoil for the audience. But I will tell you that I I was very drawn to that character who was wholly new to me as this is mostly Jane Austen characters. And I was like, oh, cool. That's how that character was adapted. Oh, cool. That's how that character was adapted. And then I was like, oh, a whole new character. And I actually really care about him. Yeah, me too. Thank you guys. Yeah, I I was very much like, I always, I love that adaptations and that's something I've always dabbled in but I've really enjoyed lately the idea of like you know the Star Wars from a certain point of view anthologies wait wait hang on I'm a I'm a very big Star Wars fan and I don't know what you're talking about so there's only two of them and they've come out over the last like three or four years maybe a little bit longer ago than that um but the first one is just called Star Wars from a certain point of view and the idea is that it's like 20 short stories each of them the idea is like you take the camera in star wars and what if you just moved it like a little bit to the left and looked at what was happening just off to the side like and that's what i really loved about doing this is like pride and prejudice is still happening just like off to the side i feel like i'm blowing molly's mind with like this new star wars knowledge yeah my my if if this was a visual medium listeners my eyes are just like flicking back and forth like thinking like when am I going to read this because I like have to go do it right now really fun there's some amazing authors who they got involved too like Zoraida Cordova writes an amazing one Griffin McElroy who's like one of my all-time favorite heroes like writes a story in one of them they're fabulous I can hear Graham on the other side of this podcast being like Molly stop beaming it's an audio (laughs) medium tell the listeners you like this (laughs) listeners I like this I like this but yes Yes, back to Jane Austen and, and and this. That yeah, that is what it felt like. It felt like I'm watching Pride and Prejudice happen on the side, but getting to follow a whole new character through an adventure that like I didn't necessarily know was happening and and it's happening alongside and in tandem with Pride mm-hmm. and Prejudice, but she gets to kind of have her own story. And speaking of Jane Austen and things you did carry over from the story, you carried in without giving too much away some of the class Mm, commentary that Jane Austen so heavily trades in. And in my experience, as I keep saying on this podcast, often gets dropped in modern adaptations. Can you talk a bit about infusing that dynamic into the novel? Definitely. So I think while it does often get dropped, I think it's one of the things that's most important to Jane Austen. And I, a lot of adaptations do do it really well, like Fire Island, not to spoiler, your next episode, like that captured that so perfectly. But I mean, I don't want to spoil the next episode for the listeners, but I gushed about that in Fire Island. Like literally like the first like five minutes of Fire Island, I like was like sh- pointing at the screen and shouting to no one. I was watching it alone. Like, oh my God, this is how you do it. Like, this is what you do. You take up Pride and Prejudice, you put it in a similar microcosmic society. And that's how it works. Um, you have to film a second Fire Island episode so I can be on that one too because I have a lot of thoughts about it. <laughs> um, or like, have you guys read Unmarriageable? Mm-mm. Not yet, no. It's it's again on the list of things that people tell us to read. Yes, good. But that also like, so that's Unmarriageable colon Pride and Prejudice in Pakistan. And that also like picks it up and puts it in a very like class-based society. And it's just like so much of the problems you encounter in Pride and Prejudice are based on class and the way that the characters move throughout the world. Obviously, for the Darcys, those are not the same. Even calling them problems, like, isn't quite the right word because they don't have problems. They're fabulously wealthy and fabulously rich. But I wanted Georgiana to have to reckon with that a little bit because you don't see the Darcys really ever reckoning with their wealth um, in many adaptations. And it just felt like almost irresponsible to not, when you're talking about the story from Georgiana's perspective, at least, to not deal with that in some way like she's at this boarding school that her family's attended for generations you know all of for all of her problems anything that could be solved with money is solved with money um and it just felt important to like discuss that a little bit 
and to say like, okay, like, yes, we have problems. Certainly the fact that she has money doesn't mean Georgiana does not have problems, but she has different problems than like a Bennett character would in this same world. And I just, I wanted to see them exploring that a little bit. And I really love how it turned out and like the way that the different characters interacted with it. I was really pleased with how it all came together. Yeah, definitely. Because I think when I'm reading Pride and Prejudice or like when I was reading Pride and Prejudice, by the end of the book, I was like, well, Bingley and Darcy, they're rich, but they're still good people. And so like, and I don't care about their money or their privilege because they're good people and mm-hmm. they do good things with it. But like Caroline Bingley and, and Catherine de Bourgh, like I hate them um, because they're rich. Classist monsters. <laughs> right. Well, and I feel like it's also easier to separate in the original almost because like, okay, they have 10,000 a year. I know that's a lot, but it also means nothing to me. Right, it's distanced. But with this, it was like, yes, Georgie is a good person and Fitz is a good person and they're rich. But like, she actually has to reckon with like checking her privilege and being like, oh, like not everyone has this. This isn't normal necessarily. It is how I was raised and I can't change that. Mm -hmm. But at least I can acknowledge that I'm privileged in this way. Right. And I was very heartily inspired in writing the whole book, but in this part, particularly by both Clueless and by Legally Blonde, two of my favorite movies of all time. And like the way that the main characters in that are both very privileged women who like don't inherently change who they are, but have to reckon with how they move through the world and the way that what they do affects people. And I really wanted to see Georgiana go on a similar journey. Yeah. I love that. So I want to talk a little bit more about um, adapting this as a YA novel. Mm -hmm. What was the hardest part about adapting it as a YA romance and also the most fun part? I almost feel like I cheated a little bit by picking Georgiana to adapt because she's just like, it's a very easy one-to-one transfer. She's a teenager already. Like I aged down a few of the other characters, Um, Darcy and Lizzie and their whole gang are in college in this version. They're like 20. Um, so they come down a little bit further than what the age gap would be in the book. Um, but they still like by being in college are in a different world than Georgiana's boarding school life. But I just feel like I was just like, yeah, it, she's a teenager. She lives at home with her tutors. Just move it on over to a boarding school. It's amazing how many things you could just move on to a boarding school. There's like, <laughs> as I was writing, I'm like, oh my God, no wonder everyone writes boarding schools. There's no parents to deal with. Like, I know that there are there are more rules in a real boarding school than there ever is, like, a YA version of a boarding school. I know this. <laughs> but I'm not the first book to pretend that there aren't very many rules in a YA boarding school. So you still get to have all the fun of, like, sort of living a little bit more independently. But you get to also be a teenager, which is so much fun to play in. It definitely did remind me, like, of a New England version of Zoe 101, if you ever mm. watched that show growing up. Uh, Becca, that was what a compliment to give me. Thank you. <laughs> I, I was such a big Zoe 101 fan. And then I remember watching it and being, God, I want to go to Pacific Coast Academy. Right? And then looking back on it now, I'm watching it and I'm like, that is not what any boarding school has ever been like ever. It but is it's not. so fun to pretend. I, had, I was talk, talking to another author once who was telling me that he was like doing research on boarding schools because he was getting ready to write a boarding school book. He's like, yeah, there's so many more rules than you think. And I had that conversation before I ever wrote Accomplished. But as I sat down for this stuff, it's just like, It's a fancy old rich person boarding school. There's probably less rules here. (laughs) Yeah. Listen, listen, like there's no need for it to be like to the letter, like every single boarding school that actually exists. A lot of boarding schools are very boring places, I'm sure. But those who attended boarding school can uh, actually let me know if I'm wrong about that. Don't let me know because it's too late. The book's written. I like to pretend for anything that like does not quite work. Like, my geography also might be a little messy, but this is already an alternate universe where Pride and Prejudice doesn't exist. So maybe also in this alternate universe, boarding school rules are much looser, and the geography of New York State is slightly different. I mean, I'm from upstate New York, and I was like, yeah, it makes sense that she has to drive six hours to Rochester. That was definitely going to hold up, no matter where you are. Like, So I went to college in upstate New York, and that's where I like got picked up for the inspiration. But I, like, I do think I moved to the Endless Mountains region into a different area of upstate New York. That's but okay. it's fine. <laughs> they were taking a, a loop-de-loop around yeah. the, the scenic route. They had a lot of emotions, so their, their like navigation was not very good. Yeah, and it was foggy. Right, right. That was based on, this is, I won't go into too many details about the scene, because it is near the end of the book, but there's a scene where they're driving through like terrible fog in the Endless Mountains region and had to pull over. And that was based on a thing that did happen to me driving back to college when I was in like from Thanksgiving break once. I had to like, pull over at a truck stop for like an hour because the fog was so bad. So Wow. Yeah, I didn't have nearly the situation they have in the book because I was alone, devastatingly. But uh, Who was your favorite uh, Pride and Prejudice character to adapt? 
so remember earlier when I was like, all my questions to your answers might be pretty similar. The answer to this is once again, Charles Bingley. <laughs> yeah. Charlie Bingley, as he becomes in Accomplish, is as I was writing him, I'm like, this is the greatest piece of contribution to literature I've ever done. Quite frankly, he's in, in our version, he's like a himbo frat boy with a heart of gold. And I just, I just love him. He's so much, everything he writes is like ends with an exclamation point. And he just like, we meet him like at a frat party where he helps Georgie like learn how to use a keg and then just like goes very quickly along on her elaborate matchmaking schemes, including like setting off fireworks at like a random high school. I just, he's such an absolute delight to move through the world with. And I love him. He really is a himbo. That is so correct. I was like, what is the word for this sweet, drunken, like love bug who everyone's obsessed with and he's hot? Like he's totally a himbo and he's so pure. He's, 100% 100% of Hemsworth. Like, we first meet him at, so it's like a, a, a autumnal colors themed frat party. And, <laughs> you know, as, as they have in college. And he's just wearing, like, no shirt but two autumn leaves. And just like, yeah, what more do you need out of a Bingley than that? I have to say, the way you manifested Bingley into the modern world was like, like, had me grinning the entire time because I was like, yes. This man would be this positive ball of muscles and beer and pureness for everybody. <laughs> Purity is the, the word I'm looking yes. for. This is a literary podcast. <laughs> yes. So he was so much fun. And then a little side shout out as well to Lydia Bennett, who was also really fun. I actually, Lydia was not in the original version mm. um, that I wrote because I, as I mentioned before, I'm a big Lizzie Bennett Diaries fan. And I just have always thought that the way they portrayed the character on that, both in her storyline, which I won't go into Molly, no spoilers. Um, and the actor, um, MK Wiles were just perfect. So I like didn't want to mess with it. But my editor was like, listen, you're telling Pride and Prejudice, Lydia, we're telling a Wickham story. Lydia needs to be involved. Um, so I ended up putting her in and I really like how she came together as the, as she calls herself, self-proclaimed goddess of Target. Yeah. I was going to say she works at Target. It's perfect. Yeah. It's exactly who Lydia Bennett would be in this day and age. Yeah. That was like a, the, the the last scene we added. That was like the very last edit that one got to- that scene got tossed in there, but I, I just had so much fun doing it. Like experiencing the Darcy's experience as super Target for the first time turns out was what we needed in our lives. Oh, absolutely. So on the flip side of that, who was the hardest character to adapt? Hmm. I mean, in a way, Lydia gave me that little bit of like, oh, I don't want to mess with like the adaptations I know and love of her. And I also like didn't want to make Lydia a villain, which when you're telling Georgiana's story could be very easy to do because Wickham is a fairly major character in the book. Wickham, like the sort of opening incident, Georgie's back at school and then she finds out that Wickham is back. He's not at school, but he's like lurking around the campus trying to get her to like get back together with him and join up with him again. And so it'd be so easy to make Lydia like just like Wickham's side piece. And I don't think she's portrayed like Georgie is not going to like be her best friend or anything like that. Um, but I really wanted to make it so that she still had her own like internal life and was not just a caricature of herself. So that was definitely a line I like worked carefully to thread. Yeah, I don't want to give away any spoilers about how the how that plot line wraps up. But just for your knowledge, I really liked how that ended up. And good, good. I, li- I like to imagine that Georgie in in her way, like, found some sort of camaraderie with Lydia and like mm-hmm. felt like care for her because they both dealt with the same guy. Right. And yeah, oh, that's all I'll say about that. I'll just say, I think generally uh, one thing I really appreciate about more modern adaptations of Jane Austen is exploration of these sort of victims of these rakes. Right. As they, they are called, I think like if, to go back to a former episode of ours, if you look at the 2008 ad- adaptation of Sense and Sensibility, there's much more said about Colonel Brandon's ward in that version mm. than there is in any other version. And you actually meet her and see like what her life is. Right, now. right. And I think that uh, the uh, <laughs> reclaiming of characters like Lydia and in this case also Georgie as well and their stories and how they deal with these awful men is is really one of the best parts of seeing more contemporary adaptations of Jane Austen work. Yeah, definitely. It's interesting because like, I've had a lot of people tell me that how much they hated Wickham in this version. And like one person, a friend of mine was like, yeah, this is the worst. This is the most I've ever hated Wickham. And I'm like, oh my gosh, really? Like, I, cause I don't think of him as that different as the average Wickham. But then I sort of realized like, cause this is the first time, I mean, not the first time there are other versions, but one of the few times you see Wickham through the eyes of his victim, like the entire time, like you see his gaslighting and the way he's manipulating her. 
Um, I also think once you take away, you know, the cravat, he becomes more skeezy, like, immediately, apparently. But, like, he very much is still, like, a character who the whole school loves Wickham. Like, the so Georgiana is in the marching band in this version. That's my musical um, little twist for that. And Wickham was as well. And the whole band, like, hates her for getting Wickham kicked out. And so you, by seeing it from the victim's perspective, you can, like, realize how bad some of these men are. Really quick side note. Uh, I noted in your acknowledgments that this is an ode to your marching band experience. Yes. What instrument did you play? I played the piccolo and the flute, um, noted lovingly by how I gently and caringly made fun of the flutes inside the book. And staff. <laughs> that, that's where all the best jokes came from. I was a choir kid in high school. And Ooh, nice. The amount of soprano jokes I have told in my lifetime are numerous. Yes, I was um, a huge marching band kid all through high school and college. That's where I met my husband um, and like most of my closest friends. So any marching band romance that is in this book, I'm not saying it's based on real life because that'd be weird, but it's very hard inspired by real life. I love that so much. It was such a, I mean, I was picturing this all happening in my high school band room. And Excellent. When I was in high school band, I had the biggest crush on a trumpet. Dangerous waters, Molly. I know. And there's just something about, I mean, honestly, oh my God, wait, I'm having a realization. <laughs> Whoa. Having a realization uh, that that guy was a Wickham. Oh my God. You'd be amazed at how many trumpets are Wickham's. I was going to say, are trumpets the dangerous bad boys of the marching bands? Oh yeah, hundred percent. I actually, I tried to make Wickham not a trumpet player at first, but I thought it was too on the nose. I tried to like make, he was a percussion player at first, but then I was writing, I'm like, this is wrong. He's such a trumpet. And I have like, I have a lot of friends who are trumpets who are like, no, I get it. That's, that's accurate. Yeah. Wow. I'm really having, like, I just got full body chills. I, because he, he had his trumpet and there's something about like the high notes on a trumpet that are just like really sexy. It's when you jump the octaves, like, and that's Wickham in the book. He's like, yeah, he's like playing like three octaves with everybody else just like because he can. And you're just like, dang, Wickham. Just because he can. Oh my God. I'm going to reread the book and I'm going to picture this guy. But yeah, so I just like had this, the vibes were immaculate they were exactly high school band so you really you really captured that well thank you I was not in high school band I was in middle school orchestra but then everyone was benefited by me quitting the clarinet but <laughs> I think my high school choir has like similar like you still get the vibes of like a bunch of musical kids who care a lot about what they're specifically doing and like that very again like it's the microcosm right it's when you take a specific type of society and you like create the stratas in it um, which Marching Man Super is like very much that. Absolutely. And huge shout out to my choir director who was very serious and very into us making really nice music together because I saw him so viscerally in the character of the Marching Man teacher in this because there is a certain type of music teacher who works with really talented high school students and is really, really invested in making sure that am amongst their personal drama, you channel their ambition to make good music. And it's so relatable. I love that. I should also clarify that like trumpets can be nice. I know plenty of nice, it's it's not that there are no trumpets that are nice, but all Wickhams are trumpets, you know? Like it's that sort of like- Absolutely, no, 100%. It's necessary, but not sufficient. Yes, exactly. I was also enamored uh, with some of the characters in this because my, without giving too much away about the plot, my boyfriend what did trombone in his marching band in college. Okay, so. nice. And all the main characters in ours are trombone players. I picked that because it was like slightly removed from, because I didn't want to make it a flute player because that felt like too self inserty And also Georgiana and flute are like not quite the right. It's, it's, too, it's too close to pretty. Like I needed it to be a little quirkier. And then I married a saxophone. So that would be weird too. And then I sort of am running low on quirky instruments. So trombone was like a good, like gentle misfit, but still like effective. And then she would sit by the trumpets, which was very effective for Wickhaming. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I always thought that the quirkiest and most expertise of the marching band were the oboists because I was mm. like that double read. I don't know what to do Wait, did that. you have oboes in your marching band? Um, We didn't have a marching band at my school, okay. but we did have a band and they certainly had oboists. Okay, because you you, can't, you like usually can't march with an oboe because the double reads like crack. So I was like, oh my god, that they're so talented to march. No, no, with no, an no, oboe. no. My school's not talented. <laughs> you probably are marching oboes. They're just like less. Yeah, and then there's just like the French horn if we're rounding out the brass section. Oh, yeah, and also shouts to the tubas, obviously. But shout out to the tubas. I they just I needed slightly like easier to maneuver than a tuba. Yeah, and Georgie's kind of small. Yeah, I mean, like I know plenty of small tubas, but it just. I, I sort of understand the physics of a trombone slightly better. 
It also allowed for my favorite um, hilarious, horrible marching band incident scene that I won't go into too many details because when you guys read the book, I'm assuming everyone who listens will read the book. You guys are, you seem like good people. You'll all read it. (laughs) Um, When you get to the marching band field-based incident, I will tell you that was based on real events as well. (gasps) It didn't happen to me. I saw it happen from the stands when I was back at college for a, a homecoming game. And it has become known in history as Flominoes, which stands for Flute Dominoes. Oh my gosh. Well, listeners, if that does not convince you to go out and buy this book, I don't, I'm not sure what will, because Molly and I both viscerally had the same reaction to hearing that that was a real life event. Yeah, we were like, no. It's okay, no, no actual flautists were harmed in the making of this book, so it's fine. Amazing. Fantastic. I did want to ask about another thing that was integral to Georgie's experience as a teenage girl, because I felt like it was relatable to me and also I think to a lot of listeners of this podcast, which is that she's a Tumblr girl who's obsessed with a BBC series. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yes. Uh, Georgie's fanfic life is just, I love it. I actually went online and Googled, are teenagers still on Tumblr? They are. They're all still on Tumblr. I love it. It's for for maybe our listeners who are not as internet-y as I was as a teenager. Like Tumblr was the place for nerdy teenagers who were a little too obsessed with nerd culture and like niche shows that often came from the UK or books that were really important. And it was a community of fan fiction that was big if you were really, really nerdy. <laughs> yes. And I spent I was so pleased too, because I had to like So obviously when you're writing a book, especially this is my debut, like you write it over the course of several years usually and edit it. And each time we got closer, I'm like, okay, like I need to check in and see what teens are actually still using for fan fiction because I wrote a ton of fan fiction as a teenager. It's where I like learned how to write, but I haven't done it as much recently because I then realized you could just write at fanfic of old books and then you could sell it (laughs) that public domain (laughs) so i'm really still writing fan fiction it's just that i don't have to pay anyone to do it because the you know the copyright is expired on jane austen great work um pride and prejudice great for us as well i will mention (laughs) yes exactly um but i was like oh god thank god tumblr still exists but yes i had so much fun writing like georgiana's fanfic obsession it's funny it used to be like a even bigger part of the book in the sort of earliest drafts um, and it had to get cut down a little bit to make room for other things that needed to make its way in. But I just, I love that she gets into the, like, she's in this very like Downton Abbey-esque BBC show called Sage Hall that she's obsessed with, which fun fact is the name of the church on my college campus where I got married. And I didn't realize I accidentally did that until like the arcs were out and a friend of mine who I went to school with and is also, is, is works in publishing. So I said her an arc, she's like, oh my gosh, Sage Hall is so fun. I was like, oh my God, I, I didn't even realize. <laughs> Oh my God, I love that. It's like, wow, completely. I was just trying to think of something that sounded vaguely British, like no idea at all. But I, I got to sort of put in this idea that she like discovers her own romance um, through that, which fun fact is how I found out that I had a huge crush on my now husband because I actually wrote my first book. I mean, I think I used the word book loosely. It was like a 60,000 word nano fantasy project. Um, my sophomore year of, high, of college. Um, and I sent gave it to my roommate afterwards to read. And she was like, this is super fun, but oh my gosh, the you know the love interest is like totally Dustin, right? I was like, what? No. no. Oh. <laughs> and now we've been married for four years, so like it works out very well. Wow. That is the cutest thing I've ever heard. My goodness. She did tell that story in her Maid of Honor toast at my wedding, so it all got to come around full circle. I love that so much. So also fan fiction wise, what was your like go to for writing for fan fiction? What was your project that you always worked on? So I did a lot of Boy Wizard stuff, Natch. Um, and then I also, because I wrote a lot of Neopets fan fiction. <gasps> That's incredible. Becca and I both just grabbed onto our chairs. <laughs> yeah, that was the same physical reaction too. That was so impressive. I spent so long trying to get into the Neopian Times, which is the newspaper that was published on the website. And I never did. I feel like I should be able to put like a note in the back of this book that was like, okay, I, I did get, I have a book now. Is that, we maybe it's going to be one Neopian Times trophy. If I like mention a Neopet in it, would that be enough for this retrograde, like retrograde phrase that I need from these nameless souls on the internet who control the Neopian Times? I have so much <laughs> Neopets fan fiction, like on my old computer save. Just like contemporary YA essentially, but about like my alert. And that sentence was incomprehensible to anyone outside of a certain like 10 year age period. So I think that talking about Neopets is an excellent 
way to end our discussion of this Jane Austen adaptation that you've written. It's exactly where we all thought this conversation would end when we started it, so. Yeah, totally. I have a couple questions for uh, the benefit of our listeners. Can you tell us when this book might be coming out? So it releases July 26th. Um, which is the day that this episode is dropping? Correct. Yay, it's out today. It's out now. Go to a bookstore. Panic. Run. Leave your phones. Get out of here. Go get it now. Go to your local indie. Um, I am there are signed copies available um through my local indie, one more page books, um, on their website if you want to get things signed and signed and personalized. Get those in very quickly because the book is now out. So technically the pre-order part is sort of behind us, but I'll still be signing books there. Um, and yeah, it's available anywhere books are sold in the U.S. and also Australia and New Zealand. Nice. A lot of our listeners are actually in Australia, so that works out really well. I think it comes out the same day. I'm not positive. I'm pretty sure. And it's in paperback there because Australia, which is fun. Amazing. So we'll link that in the episode description. We'll link your bookstore and um, thrift books and bookshop.com and all the good stuff. All the best. All right. Fantastic. Do you also want to tell our listeners where they could find you on the Internet if they just like to hear your takes in general life. So if you've enjoyed my general vibes, um, you can find me on pretty much all social media platforms as at Quainiac, which is Q-U-A-I-N-I-A-C. Um, I'm on, you know, TikTok. Well, I'm, I'm on TikTok. I have a TikTok. If anyone has any ideas for how I should use TikTok, please pass them along to me. Um, I spend most of my time on Instagram and I'm on Twitter as well. Amazing. Well, thank you so much for joining us. And thanks for letting us read your book in advance. It was so good. And we had such a great time talking about it with you. And listeners for next episode of this show, because you guys keep asking, uh, you want to tune in to, as we've discussed, Fire Island available on Hulu. That is what we will be covering. Um, And until next time, thank you, Amanda, for joining us and stay proper. And Find a nice trumpet player. Yeah, they exist. Yeah, just go find one. Yeah, write in with your nicest trumpet players. Well, do we, you guys can do like a classified ad. Pod and Prejudice is edited by Molly Burdick and audio produced by Graham Cook. Our show art is designed by Torrance Brown. Our show is transcribed by Speech Docs Podcast Transcription. For transcripts and to learn more about our team, check out our website at podandprejudice.com. To keep up with the show, you can follow us on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook at Pod and Prejudice. If you love what you hear, check out our Patreon at patreon.com slash pod and prejudice to see how you can support us or just drop us a rating and a review wherever you listen to podcasts. Thanks for listening.